I'm going to tell you about uh, a family of genetic elements that are ubiquitous in archaeal, bacterial, and many viral genomes. And they function to introduce vast amounts of diversity into protein coding sequences. Um, and I'll start by telling you how they were discovered uh, and what their conserved properties are, and then uh, share some recent data, uh, some of it's unpublished, on how they work and how they may shape microbial communities and humans uh, and other hosts. Uh, so the story begins with an interest that my lab has had for quite some time in Bordetella species, which are gram-negative bacteria that infect ciliated respiratory epithelial surfaces in, in humans and other mammals. And we were studying a phospho-relay system, which we knew at the time orchestrates the Bordetella infectious cycle. Um, it's a BBGAS uh, phospho-relay, and it can position different Bordetella species into phases that are adapted for life in the respiratory tract or adapted for life outside of the host or potentially during, for transmission. Um, and one day, a graduate student in the lab, an MD-PhD student by the name of Ming Lu, decided to look for bacteriophage. And his goal was to ge develop genetic systems to manipulate Bordetella. And so sure enough, he found phage. And some of them had the interesting property of being trophic for the phase of the organism that's adapted to life in the respiratory tract. And so we thought that was kind of interesting um, and hypothesized that maybe what they're doing is recognizing a BBG-activated cell surface determinant, and that, in fact, is what uh, the case was. These phage recognize a surface protein called protactin, an outer membrane autotransporter that's also a component of our current acellular pertussis vaccines. But the situation was a little bit more complicated than that. And Ming noticed that at a frequency of one out of a million, sort of a, an event that many of us might sweep under the, under the rug in a sense, he could isolate variants that were tropic for the other phase of the organism, in this case for Bordetella bronchoseptica and ex vivo phase, or viruses that didn't seem to care. And he also recognized that all of these forms were interconvertible and that the tropism of the virus was determined by recognition of different ligands on the surface of their bacterial host cells. This is an interesting observation because it's kind of a smart antibiotic. The, the organism, the bacterium, can try to run by mutating an epitope or losing expression of a surface determinant, but the virus comes right back and evolves a novel specificity that can kill the resistant organism. And so we became interested in understanding how could something like this work. The first thing we did was the obvious experiment. We looked at the virions. And if you look, you can see this is a fairly typical icosahedral head, a short tail. And at the end of the tail fibers, which are shown here, are these globular structures. And when we saw tropism switching, we noticed that there were amino acid substitutions in the protein that encodes those globular structures, called MTD for major tropism determinant. So we thought that was interesting. We teamed up with Julian Parkhill and others at the Sanger Institute to look at what this meant in terms of the sequence of these viruses. And so this is a temperate phage. It inserts in the chromosome of Bordetella. And this is the MTD gene, which encodes these receptor binding proteins. And the C-terminal region here is where we would see substitutions, nucleotide substitutions, every time the host determinant changed, every time the tropism of the virus had been switched. This region in which we saw variability is repeated right downstream uh, in a region that is actually invariant. And if we look at what is being diversified here at the C-terminus, these are the codons at MTD, what you'll notice is that the yellow positions, which are diverse, are usually in the first or first two positions of amino acid codons. And what that does is maximizes the amino acid diversity. And the diversity is fairly impressive. There are 23 of these variable positions in this region. Any of the four nucleotides can be inserted so the DNA diversity is about 10 to 14, and the protein diversity is about 10 trillion. 
polypeptides that can theoretically be generated. But what caught our attention is that these sequences were located right upstream of what looked to be a reverse transcriptase in a double-stranded DNA viral genome, where you wouldn't normally expect to find an enzyme like that. And as you know, reverse transcriptases um, are able to take an RNA template, and if you supply them with a primer, with either a three prime or a two prime hydroxyl, and DNTPs, they will synthesize complementary or cDNA. So we wondered what these various components could be doing, and the first experiment was very simple. Ming deleted the reverse transcriptase. The virions were completely infected, but they had lost the ability to switch tropism. So somehow this metastable genetic event involves a reverse transcriptase. The variable region changes every time the tropism switches. This repeat, which is related but not identical, never changed. But if we delete it, we see the exact same phenotype, infectious virions that are unable to switch their tropism. And so a key observation came by simply comparing these sequences here with this sequence here, and what we realized is that the positions of nucleotide substitutions corresponded to each and every adenine in this invariant template repeat. And so when we saw that, we thought, well, maybe what's happening is there is a transfer of information from an invariant template to a region of variability. And that information transfer is coupled to adenine-specific mutagenesis. And so there's a very simple experiment to test that, and this was done by actually an undergraduate in the lab by the name of Sergei Dulatov. And what Sergei did is inserted a heterologous sequence into this region here, let the system do its thing, and sure enough, it appeared in the variable region, and its adenines were mutagenized. And so we realized at this point that this is a reverse transcriptase dependent, template driven, adenine specific mechanism for generating potentially vast amounts of diversity in protein coding sequences. And we also realized that it was a mechanism that had not been described before. So we call these diversity generating retro elements. And through a process, uh, that we've named mutagenic homing, there is a directional transfer of information from an invariant template to a region of variability in a target protein. Uh, the variability is site-specific. It only occurs at positions corresponding to adenines. Uh, there is an RNA intermediate, as I'll show you in a minute, and the diversity these systems can generate uh, is rather remarkable up to 10 to the 26 variants, orders of magnitude greater than what the mammalian immune system can generate uh, in making B cell or T cell receptors. And so the obvious question is, uh, has this mechanism found broader utility in nature? Uh, and the answer is, is of course. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that now. So this is a phylogenetic tree uh, of some of the several thousand DGR reverse transcriptases that have been identified so far. Uh, many of them occur in what you would sort of uh, recognize as a standard uh, eubacteria. Here's the Bordetella phage. Uh, Legionella, Bacteroides, Treponeme, Cyanobacteria, et cetera, use these for different purposes. And I'll tell you about uh, what Legionella and Bacteroides use DGRs for in just a minute. But it turns out that most of these elements are actually found in organisms that have never been cultivated. And there's an interesting story that's relating to that, and I'll, I'll just take a minute to tell you about it. And this is a collaboration uh, led by Blair Paul and David Valentine's lab at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, work, uh, uh, Jillian Banfield and, and, and co-workers in her lab at UC Berkeley, uh, Partho Ghosh uh, and members of his lab at UC San Diego, and Diego Rambula and Elizabeth Cherney in, in my lab. And the study actually focuses on an aquifer uh, 
which is right off the banks of the Colorado River in Rifle, Colorado. And this is a site that the Banfield Lab has been studying for several years because it's contaminated with uranium, which we just heard about, and selenium from mining activities that, that had occurred over the years. And what the Banfield Lab did is they pumped water out of this aqu aquifer and filtered out anything larger than about 1.2 microns. So Geobacter, uh, E. coli, though the Legionella, et cetera, would be excluded. But they retained what landed on 0.2 or 0.1 micron filters, sequenced, and did massive metagenomics and transcriptomics to try to understand what was there. And of course, they were looking for ultra-small bacteria with ultra-small genomes, which they knew at the time uh, existed and were likely to be in an environment like this. And so from this study came over a thousand new diversity generating retro elements. Uh, these are mainly chromosomal with no evidence of phage association. Uh, and there's evidence that they are actively diversifying. But interestingly, they occur uh, in these two superphyla. One is called the DPAN archaea and the other, the candidate phylum radiation bacteria. Uh, these are enriched in organisms that are ultra small with small genomes. Very few have ever been cultivated. Uh, and this group right here, interestingly, represents about 15% of the biological diversity in bacteria, which is fairly startling when you consider that it comes from uh, one uh, site of, uh, of investigation. But what was interesting about this data set is that as we look at sizes of genomes from five to six megabases all the way down to about 500 kilobases, what you can see is a fairly dramatic increase in the density of these diversity generators. And that's interesting. And we wonder if genome reduction uh, might select for this kind of a mechanism for generating variability for, for, for adaptations. Uh, you can see some of these cells here, and the bars are uh, 100 or 200 nanometers or so. So these are, in fact, very small cells. They have reduced genomes and are likely to be uh, involved in interactions with other organisms. So the distribution is vast, but everywhere we look, whether it's in an archaea a CPR bacteria, Legionella, or a phage that has one of these elements, they have characteristic, unique, and related reverse transcriptases, TR variable region pairs that differ at adenines. And so the hypothesis is that the fundamental mechanism uh, of diversity generation is conserved across what appear to be vast phylogenetic distances. A little bit about the mechanism. Uh, and I'll go through this very briefly. So one of the questions that you ask when you see a new retro element is, is what primes reverse transcription? Uh, and in many cases with mobile elements like these, uh, the answer is the target. And there are a variety of target priming mechanisms that have been described. And so this is an experiment that was done by Waltao Gao when he was a postdoc in the lab uh, and finished up by Santa Norum in Waltao Gao's lab at the University of Missouri. And the question was, what happens if you express in trans the diversifying machinery? This is a open reading frame I haven't spoken about, and it codes a small protein called AVD, which is essential for this process. And so they expressed this uh, at fairly high levels in Bordetella. Uh, and interestingly, cDNA was made, and we didn't expect that it would be. And not only was it produced, but it was dependent on the reverse transcriptase and the accessory variability determinant, and the cDNAs were themselves mutagenized at adenines. But when we took a closer look, what we noticed is a very unusual structure, and that was that an RNA derived from this region was covalently linked to these cDNA molecules. And you can see that structure right here. And while this was going on, uh, Sumit Handa in Partha Ghosh's lab, a longtime collaborator at UC San Diego, had succeeded in purifying an active enzymatic complex, which is the reverse transcriptase complex with this variability determinant. 
And sure enough, if, we, if they provide it with RNA and DNTPs, it will synthesize this exact same RNA-DNA hybrid primed at exactly the same position. But interestingly, we also see adenine mutagenesis under these in vitro conditions with purified components. And so what this tells us is that this property of adenine-specific infidelity is inherent in this very unusual uh, enzymatic process. Um, this is uh, the most amazing experiment, and I'm just going to dive down for a second here, at least in my estimation. This, again, was done by Suman Hand in Parko's lab. And the question was, what happens if you leave out different DNTPs? Can it still synthesize cDNA? And the answer is no. Uh, if you leave out DA or DG or DC, which is then shown here, but if DT is omitted, uh, even if the RNA template has adenines, we still see cDNA produced. The kinetics are slower because every single adenine is now a wildcard site for diversity. And so the mechanism, or maybe I should call it a falsifiable hypothesis at this point, uh, is as follows. We call this template prime reverse transcription. It is a unique mechanism. Uh, and it starts with a tRNA that has these adenines programmed in it. Uh, this is a substrate for this complex. Uh, and priming at a specific adenine occurs. It actually looks from in vitro evidence uh, from Suman Handa that this may be a two prime hydroxyl priming mechanism uh, via this adenine. And we sometimes see this, this uh, three prime end cleaved off. That creates a mutagenized cDNA, which somehow integrates, and this is a mysterious step at this point, to replace the parental variable region with this mutagenized version. But if you take a step back and think about sort of the molecular logic of a mechanism like this, everything that's required to do it again and again and again is precisely reconstituted after every diversification event. So this is very different from what happened following VJ or VJ recombination uh, during the production of antibody molecules, for example. Uh, the template repeat is never corrupted, uh, and all the cis and trans acting factors are, are, are stitched back together. And so we think the system is actually designed to undergo sort of iterative optimization uh, along some, some evolutionary trajectory uh, that's going to depend on the organism, its environment, and the, uh, the setup of its diversity generator. Okay, so the genetic mechanism is one part of the story. But at the other end of all of this, there has to be a protein scaffold that can accommodate and display the diversity this kind of system can afford. And so we were interested in understanding that and teamed up with a cryo-electron microscopist at, Hong, and at UCLA by the name of Hong Zhou, uh, and also with Partho Ghosh, who, as many of you know, is a superb structural biologist, and we've been collaborating for many, many years on this project. And we imaged the virions. They're typical icosahedral. Uh, virions, and at the bottom of the tail fibers, which we image by tomography, are two trimers of this variable protein called MTD. Uh, and if you look at one of these monomers, uh, the variable region is right here, and if we flip that up towards you, the red uh, side chains are the ones that correspond to diversified residues in this variable region. And so as we've been looking at these structures from the bordetellophage, from treponeme, from legionella, from archaea, et cetera, what we realize is that the adenines in the template repeat are precisely positioned to diversify solvent-exposed ligand-binding side chains in the variable region uh, of these proteins. And so there's a really beautiful coevolution between, be, between the genetic mechanism that generates variability and the protein scaffold that has evolved to display it, just as happens in the human immune system. And we know that because we have co-crystals, for example, of uh, MTD binding to its uh, substrate protactin. Okay, um, since we're a little bit late, I'm gonna cut to the chase here. 
and tell you just a, a few things, a few uh, vignettes uh, regarding organisms that use these diversity generators. And so the first I'll talk about is Legionella pneumophila. Legionella pneumophila, as many of you know, is a pathogen of amoeba, and it is sometimes able to cause uh, what can turn out to be quite serious disease in humans uh, as a opportunistic pathogen. And in the Legionella genome, uh, there is a diversity generator. It's on a genomic island. Um, fairly typical in its structure. Uh, however, there are 43 adenines in TR. And so the theoretical diversity here is, is 10 to the 26. And I believe this now holds the record uh, of the various DGRs that we've looked at. Uh, and it is functional in, in, in vitro. But what was interesting, and this is work from Diego Arambula when he was a graduate student in the lab, uh, is that at the end terminus of this variable protein, our sequences that we predicted would send the protein through this uh, secretory system, which is an alternative to SEC called TAT. It can secrete proteins with folded domains. And there is also a lipobox here and a cysteine that we predicted and eventually shows is lipid modified, which would put the protein uh, presumably in one of the leaflets of the, of the membrane. And so we looked a little bit more closely, and what we saw is that the diversified protein in this bacterium is in fact an outer membrane protein. Uh, if we take intact cells and treat them with proteinase K, we can shave it off the surface. If we mutate the transporter system, it doesn't uh, get to the surface. Or if we mutate the cysteine, which is lipidated, it also is protected from protease, and we see identical results from immunofluorescence. And so what this tells us is that in this bacterium, and this is a common theme, the diversifier is diversifying uh, a exposed region of a outer membrane, outer leaflet protein, presumably meeting, mediating interactions with ligands that are important for, for Legionella. Okay, uh, and the last uh, story I want to tell you very quickly is one that was uh, worked on by Yanling Wang when she was a graduate, when she was a postdoc in the lab and uh, picked up by Diego Arambula. And this is also a collaboration with Blair Paul at UC Santa Barbara and Sarkis Mismanian at Caltech. Uh, we, were, we noticed in studying these elements that there was a proliferation of DGRs in bacteroides species, uh, which are prominent anaerobes in the human gastrointestinal microbiome and the microbiomes of, of, of other mammals. Um, and what was interesting is that these diversifiers were encoded uh, on integrative and conjugative elements. Uh, here's a, a, a group of them in different bacteroides species. They all share similar but non-identical DGRs, uh, very similar transfer operons, et cetera. And what these are able to do is transfer from the chromosome of one host to another uh, however, they must be part of a chromosome in order to, to, to replicate. And so we thought this was kind of interesting. Um, and we wanted to take a, a, a sort of a closer look and see, well, what do these do in, in vivo in animals? So this is an excision reaction. Here's this uh, integrative conjugative element in the, in the chromosome. Uh, they can excise uh, into a circle, which can replicate for conjugative transfer, but it is unable to replicate in terms of its increasing its copy number in the standard sense. So this is not like a plasmid. Um, it leaves behind a scar in the chromosome what it excises. And the observation here, very simply, is that in culture, uh, they are relatively inactive. But if they, when they go into germ-free animals, there is anywhere from a 50 to 1,000-fold increase in the activity uh, of these conjugative elements, similar to if we express uh, a factor that stimulates this excision in vitro. Furthermore, in these same germ-free animals, uh, the variable region is diversified. And so this is a subset of the 41 adenines uh, in the variable region that are, or, or in the TR that diversify the variable region. And you can see that there is diversification occurring here. It's at a fairly low frequency, but interestingly, we see hotspots. Uh, potentially as a result of selection in the gastrointestinal tract. But the question was, what do they do functionally? 
Uh, and this is uh, where we are right now, and I'll tell you sort of what the, what the hypothesis is and some of the data that supports it. And the way this uh, experiment started, actually, was when Yan Ling ran into my office with a really beautiful paper that was published by Ian Wilson uh, at Scripps a couple of years ago. Uh, and there, the group was looking at different uh, structural uh, proteins with unknown function in the, in the human microbiome. And they decided to study a group of, of ORFs uh, in bacteroides and related organisms that were predicted to encode lipoproteins. But in fact, what they end up doing is encoding a brand new kind of pillus. This is different from the pili that we just heard about uh, from gamma in terms of structure. Uh, they're lipoprotein precursors, and at the very base, the anchor remains lipidated and stuck in the outer membrane. And they have different components ending in a tip uh, which is presumably an adhesin, uh, and interestingly, these tip proteins have uh, globular do domains that, that add to the structure, and C-type lectin domains at their C-terminus. When we look through the genome of Bacteroides fragilis, a strain that we, that we use for these, we saw this amazing collection of presumed operons that it seemed to encode different components of these very modular pili. Uh, and sure enough, the diversifiers are located right next door to stock adapter subunits and other subunits that make up these structures. And in Bacteroides, we call this protein BFT, BFDT, and it also is predicted to be a liberal protein. And so the hypothesis is that in Bacteroides, these diversifiers are diversifying tip adhesins on pili uh, with this very unusual and interesting structure. And here's some of the data that supports that. They're on the surface. They can be shaved off uh, with proteinase K. Uh, we can light up Bacteroides by immunofluorescence, et cetera. And we're now testing that hypothesis that these are, in fact, being displayed on these very special kinds of pili. So the take-home lesson, though, I think, is regardless of whether or not that model is correct, we take this as evidence for the horizontal transfer of accelerated evolvability, uh, defined in this case as the capacity uh, of a system for adaptive evolution. Uh, and for these, presumably, uh, that adaptation involves honing adhesive properties of pili to optimize residency in the gastrointestinal tract. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank the people that did the work. Uh, these were discovered by Ming Lu, a graduate student. Uh, I didn't even know he was looking for bacteriophage at the time that he found these. Uh, Sergei Dulatov soon joined him, an undergraduate. He's now an assistant professor at University of Washington studying stem cells. Uh, I want to acknowledge Wa Tao Gao, uh, a postdoctoral fellow who's an expert in retro elements now at University of Missouri. Uh, Yanling Wang, who's now at Millennium Biosciences, Bob Medicar at Stanford. This is the current group, and I talked quite a bit about work from Diego Rambula. Uh, thank our collaborators, Joe Banfield at Berkeley, uh, Partho Ghosh for uh, collaborating on just about every aspect of this project over the last almost 15 years, uh, David Ballantyne's group, et cetera, as well as our funders and all of you for coming. So thank you for being here and enjoy ASM Microbe 2018.